The International so, Atomic uh, Energy Agency has an unholy alliance with the WHO World Health Organization, which says WHO cannot examine any accident related to nuclear power, etc., without the permission of the IAEA. And indeed, it didn't examine Chernobyl. 40% of the European landmass is still radioactive, George. Turkish food is extremely radioactive. And we have to wait to see the cancers arising and do epidemiological studies, many of which have been done to expose populations. George, there's no debate about this. There's no debate. I speak to doctors all the time in medical schools, in, in hospitals, grand rounds. We all understand this. There is no debate well, in the medical Well, let me ask community. George Mambio. Only the, at the let nuclear me, let level. me ask George Mambio. Um, the 25th anniversary of Chernobyl is three weeks away. Scientists have documented extreme levels of radiation still there. Miles and miles of dead trees, mutated birds, insects, leukemia deaths of children. Is this your understanding? Oh, um, miles and miles of dead trees. I don't believe that there's um, that's an effect of Chernobyl. It might well be an effect of acid rain in the area, but um, I haven't seen any scientific evidence suggesting miles and miles of dead trees caused by the Chernobyl erosion or, or of widespread impacts um, amongst wildlife. Now, as for the leukemia incidents, yes, unquestioned. Well, uh, thyroid cancer actually was a big one amongst children, and um, there was um, some. Um, um, elevated incidence of leukemia uh, amongst particularly a few of the workers at, at Chernobyl. But the, the broader impact was a thyroid cancer, and that s could have been massively reduced, that incidence, A, by giving iodine pills to children, and B, by forbidding them um, for a period of time from drinking the contaminated milk. Um, because the authorities were so appallingly lax and didn't um, do any of the, either of those basic precautions, we see a much higher rate of thyroid cancer amongst children than there ever should have been. Now, on this, these questions that, that Helen raises, I mean, if she's honestly saying that the World Health Organization is now part of the conspiracy and the cover-up as well, then the mind yeah, boggles. I you am. Know, wh wh where does this end? If, the if, mind does if boggle. Them and the UN Scientific Committee and the IAEA, IAEA and I, I mean, who, who else is involved in this conspiracy? We need to know. Finally, well, Helen yes, Caldicott. we do. It's the IAEA that promotes nuclear power, right, but says you mustn't build bombs from your reactor. And the WHO and, and just does not... It has up. not examined the results. Yes, this is the biggest medical conspiracy up and cover-up in the by radiation. history of medicine, George. Yes. Right. So, so, right. So, so, that, so the WHO, IAEA, so, the uh, UN Scientific yep. Committee on the Effects of Atomic um, Radiation. The main thing is that the WHO was prevented or did not examine the results from Chernobyl, and it's ongoing and will be for generations and generations, George. Mm, but the United the soil, Nations did. 40 the, 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 United, the, soil the United in Nations Europe is contaminated. The United Nations Committee did examine Chernobyl. And they um, said that oh, yeah? so far the death toll from Chernobyl amongst both workers and local people is 43. Am I sorry? Are you saying you didn't know that they'd That's examined this lie, and you aren't, aren't That's aware a of their lie. report? That's a lie. What's a how, lie? How dare the, 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 they yes, examine this how and they wrote a report? How dare they say that? On that, how but dare they aware, say that? This is a total report? cover up. We're going to wrap with 10 yes, seconds yes, of you. Uh, in this I wake am. of what has happened in Japan mm. and uh, on this anniversary of Chernobyl, three weeks away, I give you each 15 seconds to express your concern as we wrap up this debate, beginning with George Mambia. Well, we have to use the best available science, not cherry-pick our sources, and we have to keep some perspective on this so that we don't see a massive rush to coal as governments get out of nuclear as a result of what's happened in Japan. And Helen Caldicott, 15 seconds. George, I totally agree with you about coal. I think it's a deadly substance and we must stop burning a la James Hansen. But we must not go from the global warming frying pan into the nuclear fire, George. This is an obscene technology. They've known about it since the Manhattan Project, see 
Borg, who discovered plutonium, said it's the most dangerous substance on Earth. Each reactor has 500 pounds of plutonium, lasts for half a million years, causing will... cancer after cancer. I commissioned a study done by Arjun Makajani from IEER about three, four years ago called Carbon Free Nuclear Free. My name is Arjun Makijani. I'm president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Two books. This one is a historic book, literally. A Time to Choose became the foundation of President Carter's energy policy, which is the only energy policy we've ever had, in my opinion. In my right hand is the one I just did last year, Carbon-Free and Nuclear-Free, a Roadmap for U.S energy policy. I examined whether we could phase out the use of fossil fuels and nuclear power at the same time. And to my own surprise, actually, I concluded not only that we could, but that it could be done rather rapidly in 30, 40 years, and that it could be done economically. Many people who are skeptical about renewables have said, well, it can be a small part of the energy sector, but it'll never be a big part of the energy. So for that, we need coal and nuclear oil. Of course, you have to have sufficient resources. So the first question is, do we have enough wind and sunshine? We have about as much wind energy potential to equal three times the total electricity generation of the United States. Solar energy is even more plentiful. A hundred mile by hundred mile area, a square hundred miles on the side in the southwest could supply all of the electricity requirements of the United States. Of course, you have to build a transmission line. There's a lot of ancillaries. It's not necessarily the most desirable way to do it. All I'm saying is, this is the size of the resource. One of my favorite pieces in terms of how we should generate the electricity is on parking lots and rooftops. The area of commercial rooftops and parking lots and all the highways, you know, in the urban areas where you don't have to build new transmission lines, you don't need new corridors, if you take the available area into account, it can generate most of the electricity requirements of these areas. In the short term, I think solar cells in parking lots and rooftops and offshore wind can allow us to introduce very large amounts of renewables into the marketplace. Even before we have a new infrastructure for transmission lines, Delaware has approved the first offshore wind project just about a month ago. I know a lot of people don't like the view. I personally think windmills are beautiful, wind turbines are beautiful, but really on the horizon they're quite small. And even if you don't like the view, I think it's part of the price we need to pay to make renewables come to market faster. Reprocessing doesn't solve the problem of long-term management of nuclear waste. You still need a repository. The French reprocess, but the French need a repository, and it's very interesting that when it comes to nuclear waste, the French are as allergic to having it nearby as anybody else. They're, well, it's all stored at the reprocessing plant instead of at the reactor. Now you use plutonium as a fuel, and it generates spent fuel. That spent fuel has more plutonium in it than regular uranium spent fuel. And what are you going to do with that? Or the most of the uranium in France, it's just sitting around, unused. On top of it, they discharge 100 million gallons a year, approximately, of liquid wastes into the English Channel. And they have polluted the oceans all the way to the Arctic. Almost no one in this country understands this or knows it. They all say, well, we should do like the French. You know, we should be like the French. And I'm saying, I don't think so. Take a good look. Don't just read the PR. <laughs> all of this material is on our website. The references are provided. Plutonium is a health risk, a proliferation risk, and it doesn't solve the waste problem. So people who say that reprocessing is recycling are very mistaken. They're at least 99% wrong because only 1% of the spent fuel is plutonium. I think the answer to liquid fuels lies in aquatic plants. You know, pond scum, cattails, um, water hyacinths. These are all very, very prolific plants. They don't need agricultural land or any land. They grow in the water. 
you can turn these microalgae into fuel either for electric power generation or into liquid fuels or into gaseous fuels. You can do biogas plants. There are at least two companies that are making what's called green crude. They grow microalgae and then they produce a crude oil from microalgae that is a lot like petroleum. So it can be used in existing refineries and you can make gasoline and diesel and kerosene and so on out of a jet fuel, industrial fuel and so on. And this is a biofuel. So the, the, the range of technologies to solve the problem is here. The main problem is the guts, the political guts. We have to be serious and stop subsidizing fossil fuels and nuclear energy. If we're serious about getting rid of these things, we have to stop throwing money at them. The oil companies get lots of tax breaks. For example, nuclear energy gets free insurance from the government. The industry is pushing for much, much larger loan guarantees open-ended for for many more plants. The nuclear industry people themselves have said that they will not build new nuclear power plants without loan guarantees and my answer to that is fine. We don't need it. If the U.S. does take this bold step with renewable fuels, I think people will be waiting in line to work with the United States to get it done in other countries as well. <laughs>Doug Rocky is a U.S. Army health physicist and nuclear medical sciences officer. Dr. Rocky has expertise in nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare operations, microwave radiation, emergency response, decontamination, and battlefield cleanup. We were the super garbage men. We had to clean up the messes. We had to identify the messes. We had to collect all the garbage. We had to provide the on-site medical care. It's a lot. All the Iraqi equipment, a lot of U.S. equipment, contains radiological components. When those, that equipment was blowing up, the radiological materials were released into the environment, exposing and contaminating. And then to top it all off, we used uranium munitions, known as depleted uranium. They've been used back in 1973 by the Israelis against the uh, Egyptians, but during Gulf War I, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, we took it to a totally new level. The use of radioactive materials on the battlefield, deliberately taken tons and tons, actually over 350 tons of solid radioactive materials, and dispersed it across Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. Taking our radioactive waste and throw it in somebody else's backyard. For the past five years, my research has focused on the damaging effects of low-level radiation. According to the United Nations Human Rights Commission, which has declared depleted uranium illegal, approximately 17 countries have purchased depleted uranium weaponry from the United States government. In December of 1992, the director of the United States Army Environmental Policy Institute was ordered to figure out ways to reduce the toxicity of uranium munitions by Assistant Secretary of the Army Walker. In 1995, the director of AEPI told the Secretary of the Army, we can't reduce the toxicity. It's not possible. The United States Army Common Task Train states very specifically, uranium contamination will make food and water unusable and yet we use it in combat all over the place. That's why the United Nations Subcommission on Human Rights had ruled that uranium munitions were an illegal weapon because they're indiscriminate. They can't be cleaned up and they last for eternity.